Hi, I'm Andrew Leventis from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. I'll be presenting my paper to you today titled The Blockbuster Picture, Cinematic Influences on Representational Painters. And before I start, I just would like to say thanks to the organizers of the conference and thanks for watching. So film and the camera have changed vital aesthetics of today's representational painting. And I wanted to take a closer look at some contemporary painters whose works embody these changes. I'll be reading from my paper, which will consider the influence of cinema on contemporary painting through the artworks of Luke Tweemans, Judith Eisler, and Jonathan Waterage. Uh, each of these artists' works evokes the look of mass media imagery, and I would argue that this draws the attention of the viewer to the structure and the source material of the artwork. And each artist does this in his or her own unique way. And to just cue up the first artist's slide, Luke Tweemans. Uh, Tweemans was born in Mortsel, Belgium, and at 18 years old, enrolled at the St. Lucas Institute in Brussels in 1976. From there, he went on to study at the National School of Fine Arts in Brussels and the Royal Academy in Antwerp. Shortly after emerging from his formal training, he abandoned painting for three years to experiment with film and video, and many of his biographers suggest that this is where he gets the foundation for his eventual mass media incited paintings. Similar to a produced television series, Tweemans often produces sets of paintings as discrete series. A few of the most widely regarded are his diagnostic gaze paintings from 1992, and these consist of 10 paintings based on a medical book. Also his heritage paintings from 1995 that are inspired by the mood of America following the Oklahoma City bombing and uh, his against the day paintings from 2009, which appropriate the use of pop television imagery. Tweemans is recognized for his process of continuously analyzing and distilling his images making many drawings, photocopies, and watercolors before creating his meticulous oil paintings. His subjects draw inspiration from film, television, closed circuit television cameras, telephone cameras, and Polaroid pictures. And an interesting note I'd like to add in here is that uh, Tweemans's blurry uh, painting effect is achieved stroke by stroke rather than wiped away. So its effect is quite different than the very famous wiping away method of Gerhard Richter. I'd like to orient your attention to the elements of Tweemann's painting that differ from the conventional approaches to representational painting. And these conventional approaches to painting generally attempt to baldly disregard the use of the camera in an attempt to appear as if anything is uh, as, as everything is rendered directly from life. Uh, conversely, Tweemans departs from that tradition uh, and he's amplifying rather than hiding his use of photo and video source material for his paint rendering. Resultantly, the effect of the mass produced image pervades Tweemans' painting style. He uses oil paint similarly to the way a watercolorist would, applying the paint in thin, fine layers in order to communicate the impression of spectral, flickering, technologically produced images. Tweemans is highly reliant on his training as an academic painter. Evidently, the paint is applied wet and wet and finished area by area, and Tweemans never reworks an area after it is dried. The alla prima paint application con contributes to the immediacy of the image. In order to achieve this, his paintings must be completed in one continuous session. Similar to Bon Fresco techniques, Tweemans carefully transitions from one finished area of his painting to the next, as to give no trace of giornata or day lines between working sessions. Thus the painting appears life and insubstantial, as would a digital image viewed on a screen. Moreover, Tweemans uses paint in a way to communicate the camera's soft blurriness. The painting appears slightly out of focus. He paints in muted local color and places his values at a high key range in order to register the picture as infrared, 
much as the camera would have recorded this, uh, this scene of Big Brother. So notice the effect of technological imagery present in his painting, Big Brother, from 2008. Here, Tweemans gives us the vantage point of a closed circuit television camera. The view the camera takes is above head height. The camera peers down from the wall over the sleeping bodies of the castmates from the popular reality series. The camera is angled toward the middle of the room, making the center of the composition the circular rug covering the bare floor. And Tweemans has often said that he chooses as his focal point an empty space. So, so the composition will look random and more um, unconsidered. One is aware that the camera has no operator since the camera is not oriented toward a subject the way it would be with manual assistance. This makes sense in terms of CCTV as the camera would be unmanned. The subjects of the painting, the beds, are slightly off center and out of frame. We can infer the beds have bodies in them but they're not the focus as they would be in a traditionally composed figure painting, for instance. In his image CCTV from 2009, he conveys a similar effect to Big Brother. The space here is at first ambiguous, but we can just make out that it's a public restroom. A woman is situated partially in and out of frame, and the haphazard diagonals indicate a camera positioned on a wall, and thus surveillance of the subject. So again, the composition itself references the clinical use of the camera, and Tweemans utilizes soft focus and neutral tones, but upon close inspection, one can see trails of color, uh, reds, violets, and greens that play off one another to activate the painting's surface and to again reference the effect of the video screen through which the scene would be viewed. The clinical look of the painting also opens up an unexpected psychological space, as the viewer becomes aware that she or he is not the only human presence viewing the scenario. The painting indicates that we are sharing the vantage point with another invisible participant, meaning that the person who looks through the camera, or in this case, through the monitor. We might speculate who exactly is on the other side of the screen with us sharing that space, perhaps a security guard, um, or is the space uh, empty, the action playing out in an empty control room with no human presence besides our own? Tweeman sacrifices his adherence to the picturesque in order to conceive of these psychological spaces, yet the picture still conveys uh, a rather soft allure that comes from his expert rendering. In painting the way a camera sees, Tweemans reminds us of our contemporary relationships with surveillance and the psychological states generated by the screen technology. The realism he expresses is one that is created by new social connections formulated by this technology. His academic training provides us an exploration of technological reality we live in and through every day. Similarly, Judith Eisler's reality is mediated by screens and layers of technological interference because Eisler paints from film stills. She notices disregarded moments in film, presses pause, records the frozen image through her camera, and uses the resultant photograph to create her paintings. Her subjects range from tightly cropped renderings of Hollywood stars to abstracted street scenes. In her images, for instance, Nikki Brand, Eisler aims to, in her own words, communicate the distance that exists between all these layers, from the image transmission, to the photos, to the DVD, to the film, to the scene. Such a painting conveys the multimedia layers that generated it. Eisler distorts her subject's coloring, washing out the tones in the figure's face and pushing the darks toward the blackest registers of her palette. She pushes the distant objects into the depths of her backgrounds through distortion as well, the objects wavering in and out of focus, appearing as if the tracking on an old VCR player is in need of adjustment. She even employs chromatic aberration in parts of her composition. That is, 
she mimics the effect of color separation that happens on video screens, especially toward uh, the periphery of, of uh, the compositions. Moreover, Eisler uses representational painting to regard how we analyze images. Her recent works are close-up face shots, such as Gina from 2012, and also two shots of Hollywood actors, such, and, such as Liz and Rock, also from 2012. In these paintings, she observes that, through visual cues, the audience can deduce how the image shapes what we think of an actor or a relationship between actors. In the single shots, this relies very much on the character's pose and expression, as well as the angle of the camera, meaning whether the camera is below looking upward or above, or if it's tilted. These paintings lead us to consider how we fabricate reality in an image. So um, it's causing us to ask questions uh, such as, what are the faces really looking at? What are they regarding? And contrary to our first impressions, they're not really looking at other people, um, but rather as film actors, they're looking at um, a bank of movie lights that are glaring into their eyes or they're looking at a production crew holding mics and uh, booms. They're looking to directors for their cues, their acting cues. Eisler utilizes the two shot to define the distance the image creates between two characters. The distance can be reduced or exaggerated to exemplify the psychological states of the characters and how they regard one another. Essentially, Eisler's depiction of reality with its pervasion of film imagery draws us to see the way we read the media images we live with. If Tweeman's work orients us to surveillance and Eisler's work towards cinematic illusion, then the work of British painter Jonathan Waterridge leads us to consider epic artifice. Waterridge engineers his compositions from start to finish as he creates stage sets in his studio that he then paints. Using not only photography, but also real life observation, Waterridge integrates life models posed as actors into his scenes. His older work, such as this one, The Architect's House, is monumental. At times his paintings exceed three meters tall and four meters wide, and the paintings portray imaginary films set in Southern California that interplay between fact and fiction. And this is just a scale shot of uh, Waterridge's work in a gallery space so that you can get a, a, an idea uh, of that. And I've also included uh, a couple of images that are a look inside Water Waterridge's studio and into his working process. Um, as, as to how he builds these life-size sets. Uh, sometimes he builds um, miniature scaled models for his more um, surreal backgrounds, such as, such as this one. It's a, a bit of a, a blend of uh, different scales in one painting. And in his early series, titled Another Place, um, the paintings include blockbuster scenes such as a car crash or a crime scene uh, and a poolside party. The subjects in this series rotate at times between the fantastic, meaning the more extraordinary, and the mundane. And all are homogenized through the format of epic cinema and uh, some of the characters are repeated throughout the series too. So for instance, as you see here, um, a father who's standing in a kitchen interior within one painting reappears as a waiter standing poolside in another painting. So the narrative extends throughout the whole series of paintings and the character actors are repeated. In the architect's house, Waterridge's characters portray drama of Hollywood cinema and history painting. It portrays the film crew creating a film, or rather an imaginary film, of Waterridge's own invention, 
about an architect who's found dead in his home. His wife, and you can see her at the, the left of the screen, she's interviewed by forensics, and uh, the, the painting depicts a failure in the acting narrative as the actor at center fails to hold the pose of his dead character. So consequently, the film actors around him break character and the film crew arrests action. According to the artist, by virtue of building sets and using actors, all my images become elaborately crafted non-events that merely have the trappings of a real occurrence, but actually do not exist outside the studio. Everything you see in the pictures is rendered false. Waterridge's later work, post-2012, as you can see here, may not be as scene-stealing with its single figures set in more uh, quotidian spaces, but a narrative potential still runs through them, taking them out of the mundane. And this is the charge ignited by the cinematic image. Rather than viewing the scene as a meaningless everyday scene, um, like where you're waiting on your floor in the lift, for example. Uh, the environment of the painting becomes part of a broader story arc. We're alerted to the fact the scene may be, uh, may be fit into a recognizable sequence of other stills that would constitute a film. So because of that, the painting becomes a kind of game and leads you to ask, you know, can you recognize the film that this scene is from? or others that are like it. Of course, we find that the still doesn't belong to any real film, but because of its cinematic format, it, it doesn't communicate the kind of drear that a mundane experience would. So because of um, the audience's awareness with this kind of narrative, um, rather cinematic exploration, they bring their familiarity with cinema to their experience of viewing this painting. So, um, in short, I hope to have highlighted some paintings that explore what kind of new realities arise from our immersion in screen technology and how the public may be more acquainted to their filters of mass media imagery than to the aesthetic of traditional representational painting. Um, these artists use paint to play into the public's use, awareness, and familiarity with screen technology. And I think it makes the representational painting appear all the more um, of this era or particular to this time because of that. So um, I'll leave you with this lovely image by Waterage. And thanks again for watching and everyone stay safe.